one of the topics that is a, a of particular interest to me. Um, it's something that I've, I, I, you know, followed and researched and looked into. And I think what what fascinates me is that it's a you could call it an inexact science. It's something where there is some science behind it, but there's also an awful lot of folklore and myths and and, and legends. Um, and you know what what I like about it is that we can actually try and understand some of those myths and folklores and and you know poke into the science behind it and that's you know that's kind of what I I really enjoy because that's that's my background it's it's um you know kind of making science understandable and using science for the fish science foods um so yeah be interesting to to have a chat and if if anybody uh, has any questions to try and answer them okay so, I mean, it's really good that somebody like yourself has dedicated their life to, you know, the biology, marine biology, and they, they want to to give that knowledge back into the hobby, um, and especially because you're so involved in, you know, ground level with the hobbyists and out there at the shops, the clubs, and you're bringing that scientific knowledge into our world and making it understandable for people that on an everyday level, wouldn't really understand. Um, myself, for example, um, you've got a really good way of, you know, translating the textbook into real life. <laughs> um, and where the normal hobbyists can then implement that into their own fish tank at home, you know, it, it's that in itself is a gift. Um, and the hobby... Yeah, it's you know, good to be the there's there's bits that I don't understand. I have to admit, you know, when you um, you go into a new topic, people speak in jargon, and 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 very often it's it's difficult to understand. But you can, you know, you can plod your way through, and it and it it sort of starts to make sense. So it's uh, it's hopefully, you know, I'm I'm just I, I hope helping people to understand little bits, and then when they they read about it or hear things, they'll know whether it's sensible or not sensible what they're reading. Because one of the issues at the moment is, you know, the internet is fantastic and, and things like this are fantastic, but there's no real way of knowing whether the information being being given is is good or bad. Um, so you, you kind of need a little bit of background just to be able to understand whether it makes sense or doesn't. Because nobody's going to, you know, nobody's going to come on a, a live stream or... or do something on Facebook or whatever and say, actually, I know nothing and this is a load of rubbish. <laughs> They're all going to say they think yeah. it's true. Some people do. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, on serious note, um, I've not, you know, I've met quite a few people that are delighted with everything that you've produced so far. Um, and, you know, you've got nothing but admiration and, and credit towards you for everything you give back to the hobby um and long may it continue well thank you i appreciate that appreciate so, it so that part out of the way <laughs> let's get on to the topic which is all about fish coloration as i said at the start um what i want to talk about first is it's really just what is fish coloration how you know what's involved in a fish producing color is you know is it a, something that just happens or is, is that a process that needs to take place and you know can you can i give a bit more information on that dave yeah definitely the, i mean fish coloration is is interesting and, and and probably the first thing to say is that fish aren't able to manufacture their own pigments so all mm -hmm. the colors that you see the the reds the yellows the blues blacks are not natural to the fish then or no that's the wrong way to say it they are natural but they're not part of the fish the fish has, has to actually consume the pigment in order to be able to move it around the body and put it in the in the skin and, and produce the coloration mm -hmm. that pigment is um is actually held in things called chromatophores or pigment cells which are in the skin of the fish and the the pigment cells, the, the positioning of them and the numbers is something that's genetic. So you might have a, a fish of a particular species that's we would call a very high quality because it's got the right coloration in the right place. 
um, and that will have a certain amount and number of pigment cells that give it the right color at the right time in in, in the right place and yeah. a poor quality fish in inverted commas would be one that perhaps hasn't got the color in the right place mm -hmm. now the, the pigment cells are divided into three so you have the black pigment cells which are called melanophores so they're the ones that hold a pigment called melanin yeah. you have red pigment cells called erythrophores which hold um, a pigment called erythrin and then you have the yellow pigment cells which are called axanthophores which hold um, a, a pigment called astaxanthin which mm -hmm. is the yellow pigment and it's actually those three pigments combined with a, a little the best description is probably a, a tiny little marble a tiny little spherical structure that is in the skin of the fish which reflects light and yeah. that the, uh, the 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 guanophores along with the or iridocytes as they're also known along with those three pigments gives you all the colors that you could you see in a fish um so you know if, if you think of a a normal aquarium you've got fish like um let me think black sharks that the red-tailed black sharks are a, are a great example they've got that fantastically intense red tail and they've got the lovely velvety black body well the, the black body is that color just because it's got melanophores so it's yeah. got black pigment in black pigment cells and the reason it's it's that lovely velvety color and like it's, it's like a deep black rather than being a a wishy-washy pale black yeah because mm -hmm. there's pigments in in you know in, in several different layers and so you, they all overlap and and they become really intense the red pigment in, in the tail of a, a red tail black shark that's because there is no black pigment there there's no yellow it's just erythrin it's just the red pigment cells um so so that's two obviously yellow is a, a third one so we've got some platys and um, some guppies you've got some of the cichlids have a, a, a base yellow a, a matte yellow color and again that's just because you've got yellow pigment in the yellow pigment cells and and nothing else and again if it's pale yellow it's normally because there's relatively few pigment cells if it's that lovely um kind of primrosy yellow that that, that d intense yellow then it's normally because there's quite a lot of pigment cells and, and and they're filled up with the yellow pigment Th those are the easy ones um well i should say the, the, the other color pigment would be if you had none of that so if there's no pigment cells and you've just got the iridocytes the, the granophores mm -hmm. these reflective structures if the reflective structures are deep in the skin then that gives you the white color so the white that's very often on the on the abdomen of the fish or you'll see in um, some of the white mollies and, you know, on, on a lot of fish species. Interestingly, if those little iridocytes or, or guanophores are on the surface of the skin, so on top of the scales, they reflect light and they become reflective. So you would see yeah, a silver kind of color. Kind of effect. Exactly, yeah, you get that, that silver. And, and again, interestingly, if you have yellow pigments and then you have the iridocytes above it, then you get a, a reflective yellow color. So you get that sort of goldy color of goldfish and, and various yeah. fish. Um, like the silver shark is another example of that. Perfect, to yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good example of them. Yeah, because oh, certainly on the on the tropical side. Mm -hmm. Then then we get where you start mixing colors. And this is this is back to school. Um, you know, most of us can remember mixing yellow and, and red paint and you end up with an orange color. And um, and that's exactly the same with fish. If you mix red pigment cells and yellow pigment cells, you end up with orange. So things like the the, the classic sword tails with that orange colour is because there's an, an even mix of the red and yellow pigment cells. Mm -hmm. If you mix um, yellow and black, you end up with brown, and that's the where you get that brownie colour on on a number of cichlids and some of the barbs and and some of the other fish. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one interesting and really interesting color, which I've not mentioned and which is a, a, you know, a key one for a lot of fish is blue. And blue isn't actually a color. It's, it's not a physical color for a fish. So if, right. if you were to take a fish and, and just, you know, scan through the layers of the, 
the skin, you would never come across blue pigment cells. So you yeah, it, the, the regal tang, for example, and that's got one of the most vibrant blues you can find. It, it, exactly, and some of the fighting fish, you know, some mm. of the vectors, um, guppies. Exactly, you can really, yeah. it, it, again, a really velvety blue. But blue is actually, it's called a, a structural colour, and, and blue is caused by black pigment cells deep in the skin. So mm -hmm. um, the, the fish have got, fish skin's got four levels, and, and if you've got blue colour, you have black pigment deep in the skin, and then you have these little iridocytes in the top layers of the skin. And instead of getting a reflective black, the interference of the, the these iridocytes on the black colour give you blue. Oh, so, uh, yeah. you know, interestingly, you, all of the fish that we've mentioned, if you if you went through, you'd never find blue pigment, but you would eventually find black pigment cells. So, uh, it's it, you know, it's fascinating to actually understand that that's all that makes up fish colour. Yeah. And do you think um, like certain environments can affect the colour itself on the fish? You know, for example, if you had a um, a cichlid in a crystal clear aquarium that's got you know high light, you know minimal plants and just really a fish only set up where maybe a bit of rock. So it's all about the fish. The focus is on the fish. Compare that same fish. Excuse me, um, and put that in a like a like a dark water tannin aquarium setup. Do you think that the fish itself produces different colours, or you know, because I, I, I've found like neon tetras are a really good example, and that's where I'm thinking of this. You know, you put neon tetras in a brightly lit tank, and they dull down, but you put them in a dark water tank, and they they do seem like they're you know they're glowing so much more. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, the 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 pigment cells, these chromatophores, they look a bit like your hand. You know, they're uh, sorry, a, a very branched cell, a bit like this. Right. And that that pigment. So if if this was a a red pigment cell, a red chromatophore, the pigment can either be sort of all concentrated right in the centre, just a little ball, mm -hmm. or it can be spread around the whole of the the pigment cell. If it's spread throughout the pigment cell, then the fish looks red. If if you've got it concentrated just into it in right in the middle of the pigment cell, then all you would see is a little red dot, and you can actually see that. I mean, the pigment cells are quite big; they're about they can be sort of approaching the size of a pinhead. So you know they're not they're not things that you you need a microscope to see. You could actually yeah. see them with a magnifying glass, um, and you can where you stop seeing them is where they all overlap, and you just see a red mass a, a, bit, a bit like the pixels on a on a computer screen or on the tv you know you the more you've got the more intense and more velvety the color becomes now what's interesting is that the that pigment and and, and how it's distributed whether it's a dot in the middle or it's spread throughout the whole of the pigment cell or in between is impacted by a whole load of things it's impacted definitely by lighting it's impacted by the water quality, by fish behaviour, um, by food, by health, by stress. You know, there's a whole load of things. Yeah. So, so just to use your your example with the the neon tetra, if you put it in a black water environment, which is slightly acidic, um, soft water with loads of tannins in, that's the the natural environment for a, a neon tetra. And what you'd find is the pigment would spread in the cells. So again, remembering the, the the pigment cells, it would spread into all the fingers and all the little extremities it of the cell. Maximizes itself. And it, yeah, and you'd end up with a, a beautiful red part to the abdomen. You'd get that fantastic blue stripe, and you'd get the nice dense color on the top. It, it works quite similar to you know when you walk into a darker room, your pupils go bigger so that they can bring in more light. Yes. It's almost. Yeah. Almost similar anyway it, it, it's exactly that i mean it's the body reacting and I, as far as i'm aware the the neon tetra probably you know doesn't think i'm in tannin rich water i need to spread the color out i no. think just the environment and the impact of the water quality on the cells is is to make them do do just that and um, conversely if you mm -hmm. have 
um, hard alkaline water, like like you know where where I live at the moment, down in the south on the south coast, we've got really hard alkaline water. If you put neon tetras in that, the 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 color pigment all contracts, and you end up with a it's still a red fish with a blue stripe. Oh, sorry, red part back to the abdomen, a blue stripe and a a, a darker color on the top. But the neon tetras I would keep in in my natural water would be a million miles away from the same fish kept in the water up in in Scotland, say, with all the tannins that you've added. And yeah. Because the pigment's contracted and you start to see the grey background colour of the of, of the tissue and what have you that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned, you know, in, in, in your question about light, and light does just the same. So darker light tends to make the fish show off its colours better. Whereas if it's in a very bright light, the fish almost wants to to hide, and its best way of hiding is to 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 not be as gaudily coloured, not as brightly coloured. So the yeah. pigment again contracts when you've shining bright light on it, or if you've got a tank with no background and and no sides to it, you know you've got light coming right the way through the tank, and the fish starts to look a lot paler and a lot a lot more washed out is probably yeah. the best description. It's almost like they, they try when they're in the dark, they, they want their colours to be more visible so that they can see where each other are and it almost allows them to, to stay with the show. Yes. Yeah. They, um it's an identity, you know, and I it's a it's a form of letting others know that they're there within their show so that they can all show together. And whereas if the light's shining right in, they all just try and disappear. It, it's and it's it's interesting the um you know the, the, the there's so many different things that can impact it which we we, we can you know talk about in in a while but mm -hmm. the fish relatively quickly can change from you know being in good brilliant coloration to to relatively poor coloration and very often we as as fish keepers we, we don't actually recognize it because although it's happening quite quickly over a space of half an hour or an hour you you gradually see that change uh, or that change gradually happens so you don't pick it out yeah and something you can you can try at home without harming the fish in any way if if you've got a tank with um well with, with pretty much any fish if you put a black background so with just a black piece of paper at the back of the tank at the side of the tank and just dim the lighting and just leave it for an hour a couple of hours overnight something like that and then take a photo on your phone of the fish and, and just, you know, you've got a picture of what it looks like in dark conditions mm -hmm. and then do this similar, but put white paper against the back and the side and, and bright light. And again, leave it a couple of hours and then take a photo of your fish. And it's quite amazing the difference between the two. You, you'll find that, um, you know, some of the black patches contract and become just a series of black spots or black marks rather than the you know a big black area the red can can fade considerably um the blue becomes broken a little bit because you're not quite getting the the melanin spreading enough to to produce blue mm -hmm. and it, it, it's quite fascinating you can you, you can actually take photos and you see two, not quite two different fish you can tell you know that ones come from the other but they do look very very different yeah um i mean when they i find in some some of the larger cichlids like um convict cichlids when they they can flare the colors quite quickly and you, you actually in my experience i've seen them they can you know they can go really dark really quick and it, it makes their shape look different compared to when they, they go pale the, when they go pale they look slimmer fish but I think when they go um, with a really bold black lines with a the darker grey, they, they look, you know, almost like they're like. <laughs> it's, and, and, and funny enough, it, 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 it's exactly that. I mean, the, where you get that sudden change like that, very often it's um, it's the hormones in the in the fish that are creating the change. Mm -hmm. So if you've got convicts are again a, a fantastic example because. They're cichlids. They're quite aggressive. They there's normally a dominant one, and very mm -hmm. often if you've got several in the tank, 
they're either showing off the males are showing off to the females the females are trying to look as healthy as possible to attract the males or you've got two males you know showing off to each other to to, to try and find out who's the most dominant and as soon as they go into that sort of um fight or flight or mate scenario then they're looking to to be as aggressive as they can and looking as big as they can and as bold as they can mm-hmm. and that's where you very quickly get the black spreading in the markings yeah. and the colors to make the fish look as as as, as um frightening to the others and as big as possible to the others yeah definitely and and what you get conversely is if you know once one has established that it's dominant then the the other male or the other female perhaps suddenly becomes very submissive and Mm -hmm. the way of being submissive is that the coloration fades yeah malali cyclists are very prone to that you have the one dominant male who seems to have all the color and the rest (laughs) seem to just fade into feed into the background almost yeah and that's that's entirely down to the um to the hormones you know it's yeah. that um it's kind of that fight or flight mechanism that they've got so even if, if you put two together into a you know, new fish into a tank they both think they're going to be dominant and so they both flare up and they'll both have fantastic colors but pretty soon in a malawi tank they sort themselves out and you you end up with one that's slightly more dominant yeah um, and he's the one or she's the one that, that retain the fantastic coloration exactly i'm just going to pop a little question uh, a comment up here from stephen bissett and um, he's talking about his rainbow fish um can you see that dave yeah i can see yeah he's saying that my rainbows are like this in the morning the dull in color when the lights have been on for say around an hour then then they're glowing all different colors especially the males so and, and rainbows are a, a good example of that. I, th- I think mainly because the males do look so stunning. If if you mm. get them, if you get healthy ones and ones that are, are ready to spawn or you know are, are mature and are, are, are showing off, then they can can be fantastic colours. I, th- I think with rainbow fish, I, it's a fish. Normally, they're not. You, you get several. You know, if you get a group of them together, you will find all the males become nicely coloured. So partly in the morning, it's because probably the, the lighting's been dull and so the, the colour pigment spread. But mm-hmm. also, normally rainbows, you get them to spawn in that early morning light. So I guess they're also, you know, in the, the, you know they're, 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 they're young fish, they're, they're mature fish that are ready to, to, to attract the female, attract the male. So they're, they're looking to, to be at their best. Yeah. So they look stunning. Yeah. I know. I mean, angels... They... Um, rainbow fish really do demonstrate so much colour, especially uh, the reds for me anyway. That I like the, the red ones. Um, it, any kind of red on um, rainbow fish just blows me away. Uh, they, they they look great. In, interestingly, a lot of fish like to spawn in that kind of half light in in the morning. So I know some of the uh, the fish breeders. I'm not sure about rainbow fish breeders, but a, a lot of people breeding corries or barbs or some of the tetras like that sort of early morning sunlight to actually be on the tank and they say that that triggers the spawning response in them and so of course when they're spawning they're they're, you know they're they're in their in their pomp they're looking as good as they possibly could do Mm -hmm. um you mentioned um you know the difference between young and old fish as well does that is that something that can affect the color quality in a fish as well it, it can there's two things that we've got no control over in in fish coloration um, one of them i touched on which is genetics mm. so you know you the, the the quality of a fish and the colors that a fish can demonstrate and, and can show are limited by the genetics yeah. so in koi are a great example of that if yeah. you spend a lot of money on a koi you can get a fish that can have stunning coloration. It can also have awful coloration. But if you only spend a few pennies on a koi, you're not going to get one that will be anywhere near as good. It's it's kind of got that ceiling that it can get up to. Um, So that limits how good the color can be. But what you can do is you can fail to to achieve that, that, you know, that, that ceiling. So you can't make a poor fish brilliant, but you can make a brilliant fish poor by not giving it the right conditions 
the other thing that we've got no control over is is the fish aging mm -hmm. uh, what you find is when they're small when they're tiny because they need to eat the pigment they haven't done so when they're when they're tiny so they tend to be this drab kind of pale gray brown sometimes black um or, or, or dark dark brown fry which has a number of benefits it, it makes them difficult to see so they're not going to be eaten by everything that's around them um you know they're, they're well camouflaged they don't stand out but then gradually as they eat brine shrimp they eat daphnia they eat water fleas algae what have you they'll start adding color so as they grow the coloration develops when they're mature fish ready to breed then they'll they'll be at their absolute best and then as they get older the pigment starts to break up a little bit mm -hmm. uh, goldfish are a great example of this when a goldfish up to a month or two old is usually a, an olivey brown color and then they pick up the coloration they'll be orange yellow white gold um depending on on the the strain and the variety and they look stunning once they get beyond 10 or 12 years old the color starts to fade and when you get goldfish that are between 20 and 40 years old mm -hmm. they go either very pale lemon or or white and and what's not known is is that because they lose the ability to put the pigment into the pigment cells or is it that the pigment cells can't hold the pigment um, yeah. cuz you can still feed them pigment enhancing colors sorry pigment enhancing foods but they just don't seem to be able to use it to deliver the color and and that's what the example i've given with um goldfish is similar with angelfish you know angelfish that are let's say three four five months old up to three or four years look great and intensely colored and then those really old ones start to look the pattern breaks up a bit and the the black becomes gray um you know the yellow becomes broken so they, they lose it here it uh so, so certainly age can make a big difference and there's nothing you can do unfortunately you can obviously you you hope you can prolong the period where they're looking at their best mm -hmm. but ultimately it's a bit like us isn't it you know gray hair and wrinkly and everything that's <laughs> it's that pigment change that, uh, that that comes just with old age it's something that uh, uh, happens you know it does happen all all too often as well <laughs> <laughs> you will like it yeah. <laughs> yeah. um so yeah um it's just one of those things i think um the key if you're looking to achieve then you know that ceiling is to to give it everything you've got right from the word go you know and and choose if color is something important to you you know you want to choose a fish that's come from good quality breeding um private breeders shops you know you can always see and check you know the, the the background to certain fish especially larger fish and you know you can you can look for quality when you're in the shop and you can and pick out things that indicate that that young fish for example is going to achieve good quality at, you know when it hits its peak um is there any tips that you you've got for um, I mean, you know if you walk into a fish shop and you're looking for i don't know um i don't know in general you know it's hard to tell most people anyway when you're looking at a young fish whether or not that's going to achieve a what you know show showing in colors or not it, it i mean it's really difficult because unless you know the background to the fish and what it's been fed on and um you, you, your best bet is to know what the parents are like yeah so because that kind of gives you a a good indication of what what the fish will look like i mean mm. i think in a in a in a shop generally you, generally you won't see the best colors in a shop because the fish are they've they've been there maybe a few weeks you know they've been imported they've been quarantined and then they're put into a tank where every now and again some of their you know the other fish in the tank are removed and are sold so the fish are, are slightly stressed are yeah. you know that they, they, they're they're going to be on their guard all the time. Um, they're fed, but they're competing with a lot of fish in, in a in a tank. So they're not going to look as good as you could make them look at home. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, also, they're not in 
in a tank where there's lots of deco and lots of um, habitat for them to to feel at home in, because yeah. the you know the shop's got to be able to catch them. Um, so exactly. the last thing you want is, yeah. is a fully planted tank and then trying to catch the fish. So what I like in some fish shops is when you go in and the, you know all the fish tanks have got black backgrounds. I think that really does help gauge you know what they'll look like when you get them home. I, I think, and, and certainly that you know, going back to the black background and black gravel is is good as well mm -hmm. because the you know if you have a black background but you have white gravel, then you still got the fish trying to react to the white oh. gravel. They'll, they'll be pale, but no, certainly if you've got black a black background and, and duller lighting, then you'll see better the the uh, the true colours of the fish. But mm -hmm. interesting, a, a lot of fish that there's not massive differences in in the colour you'll, deli you'll deliver because they haven't been bred in captivity that many times to lose the the, the wild coloration. But things like uh, guppies, betters, koi, goldfish, they've been bred, you know, generation upon generation in captivity. So certainly you can start to find colours that are, are missing or colours that just won't develop. And that's, you know, perhaps more importantly, where you know something about the background or you you buy a number and try and pick out the best ones. But it, it is difficult to say exactly what to look for. Um, I, I find it fascinating. You know, I've, I've spent many a, a happy hour looking at, at tanks of, of koi or, or vats of koi, li little koi, trying to pick out what the best ones are. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can look at them at that side, but actually, you know, what they'll look like when they're 24 inches long can often be completely different and that's yeah. where the, you know the quality of the fish comes in that's why you spend three or four thousand pounds on a a real high quality koi mm. and maybe yeah. six pounds on a fish that'll go in the pond and look pretty yeah and i think if you are you know if, if you're serious about what you're looking for you're you're, you're going to spend the time to research the parents and you know you're going to you're not just going to walk into a fish shop and say i want that one you know, you when you when you've got an idea, you're taking your fish, you're going to feed it, you're going to raise it, and you're going to put it in a show with a goal to hopefully win that show. You you have to know the parents because it's impossible to to invest in a fish successfully without having a bit of that background. I think, I think and, and that's true. And the, and the other thing that um, you know, if you're a, a a fish keeper that shows fish or is is looking to develop real high quality, really great coloured fish, mm -hmm. then you're probably looking for parents to breed, to deliver, you know, offspring that are that colour. So yeah. you might be looking for a, I don't know, a, a male that's got a lot of black coloration in it and a female that's got lots of red coloration to get the mix that you want in in the in the offspring. So uh, so there, yeah, very much it's a case of use you know, picking fish from different d different lines and, and making sure that you're breeding them correctly, which, yeah. I mean, I've never done it, but I understand that's the same, whether you're breeding guinea pigs or rabbits or dogs or whatever. It's 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 the brood line that's important, isn't it? Yeah, and you look for certain features on each side and <coughs> put them together. Yes, yeah. And certainly with, you know, things like the guppies, that's what, um, what people are doing. They're yeah. trying to breed pure to a particular strain and and that you can't do that just by breeding you know the parents with their offspring and the offspring with the, the next generation of offspring you've got to bring sort of new genetics into it to make sure that the, the strain remains healthy um i think um i read somewhere that when you're breeding copies there's only so many times that you can breed within the same bloodline before you get major problems um yeah, I, I've heard that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm no expert on it, but um, I've certainly heard. And, and it makes sense, you know, if you were breeding, you know, mother with son, son with with grandson, grandson with great grandson, you, you, you're going to end up with some issues because you're you're not getting that genetic diversity. Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting with guppies particularly that they they always in, in the past were the, the, the go to fish when you started a new aquarium. They were hardy. You could put them in. They would just. They would be the fish that would help to mature the tank. Mm -hmm. And now they're much more sensitive. You know, they're, they're one of the fish that 
sometimes you put in and they're really difficult to to keep healthy because they've lost that strength in their uh, their genetic makeup yes because they've bred more just for aesthetics as opposed to health almost to some extent yeah yeah it's interesting you know but um you know from a fish keeper's point of view then what what can we do you know we've heard about the how the fish does it you know how the environment affects it so what what can we do as a fish keeper to impact the quality of our fish there's i mean there's there's a lot um obviously bearing in mind that there's a limit to how good the coloration can be mm -hmm. what you're looking for is is to get pigment into the pigment cells and make sure it is as spread about or as contracted as is necessary to produce the colors um so the first thing that you can do is is to make sure that you're feeding the right foods to give the pigments so we we've essentially we, we said before there are three pigments you've got red yellow and black mm -hmm. red pigment um you get a lot in krill you get a lot in shrimp meal you get quite a lot of red pigment in um things like spirulina algae chlorella algae you also get it in any fruits that have got red skins so tomatoes um interestingly have got loads of red pigment in that if that's included in the food you can you can deliver the erythrin that, that gives you the the red color mm -hmm. yellow is um is the astaxanthin and you can get that naturally from things like again krill um spirulina purple carrot or carrot is a good one um and also things like marigold has the yellow oh. pigment, which can be used in in certain fish foods and then black and because blue is linked to black coloration the blue color you can improve with with um things that will deliver uh, melanin now melanin is an interesting one in that melanin the fish doesn't eat melanin it eats a, a or gets it through an amino acid called tyrosine which the fish right. then converts to melanin and melanin or sorry tyrosine is present in big numbers in fish meal in in soya products um and in some of the algae um, touching on blue richie asked a question about 10 minutes ago about um you know what kind of foods can you give your fish to improve the blue colors so it's quite interesting that you're talking about that. It, it i mean with the blue it's definitely giving them that stuff to enhance the black pigment because mm -hmm. the black is the thing that um that that's, that's how been interfered with by the um the, the iridocytes or the guanine yeah. so yeah the soya protein um or soya meal fish meal spirulina algae are, are three that are great for the black mm -hmm. so in terms of the food giving the fish the pigment foods and, and and repeatedly doing so um if you just give them one pulse of of color food and then give them food with no coloration in it and, and that would actually be quite difficult because they can pick pigment from all over but if you were able to do that you wouldn't get good coloration that this pigment seems to go into the chromatophores and then after a while it it, it moves away or it's, it's broken down or it doesn't stay in delivering the right color so after a period of time you need to replace it the best mm -hmm. thing to do is just to keep trickling color into the fish in the foods that you give into the fish all of the time so i would suggest you know just continually feed there are certain foods that you can give just to boost the the color um so foods that are rich in krill are great because the krill has got fantastic red pigment enhancers great yellow there you go yeah the krill flake food perfect and and that's got that that particular food has over i think it's 27 percent krill so there's an awful lot of krill in there to to punch the color and we, we we talked about rainbow fish before but the krill 20, food was just that 26 one percent out <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that uh, kr krill flakes and 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 krill for, for bigger cichlids you know even bits of prawn and bits of of, of actual full krill can okay. make a difference um if you feed in the the, the color and, and the krill would be a good example if you've got fish that have got white and red then mm -hmm. sometimes you can add too much krill and again yeah. koi would be a good example of that if you had a a kahaku so a koi with red and white so essentially a kahaku is a, is a, a white koi with red 
marks on it, red patches on it. If you feed too much krill, too much color enhancing food, you can end up with the white going a pink color. And that's simply because there's so much erythrin sort of pulsing around in the body of the fish that it can't put it all in the chromatophores and it just is circulating around and it makes the white go a, a, a pinky color. Yeah. If you stop feeding for stop feeding the color enhancing food for a week or so, then that all is pushed out of the body and you go back to white and, and red colour. So theoretically, you could actually have a, a pond full of pink koi if you wanted to. You could make them, yeah, you, you can You can never get the white to go an intense red or pink colour. It, no. it won't be pure white. It won't be, they, they describe it as being snow white and, and, and you know, fantastically red. Um, you end up with great red, but you also end up with a, a pinky hue to the to the white, which is no good. No. So, you know, just sort of to, to finish the answer for you, the the things you can do, definitely feed the right food. Make sure that the water quality is suitable for the fish. So mm -hmm. make sure that if you've got soft acidic water fish, you're giving them that water. The same with the hard water species so that they're relaxed, they're happy, they like the water conditions. Yeah. Avoid stressing the fish. Avoid un unhealthy fish. The, the, the instant thing that an unhealthy fish does is it it sort of goes dull in color because its focus isn't on looking good its focus is on how does it get better so they yeah. use the coloration um, avoid bright light so you know try and make it a, a more even light or areas of darkness in the tank where they can get away mm -hmm. and also try and avoid um like routine addition of things like salt unless it's brackish water fish and medicines so a lot of the you know, formalin and, and the dye based medicines will just make the coloration go off a little bit while it's in the water yeah the, the important thing to remember is nothing's permanent um so if you've got fish that were stunning you can get them almost back to that by just correcting things and giving them the right pigment you, you can Based environment, <coughs> food, and you know you should reach your potential. That that's that's the aim all the time is to get them looking as good as they possibly can, and and that's yeah. something. And and you know you said it right at the start, and it's an important point to make. What we're talking about is doing it naturally. It's the way that they would do it in the wild. Is mm -hmm. by, you know, they consume foods naturally that would give them the pigment. What we're not talking about is injecting them with hormones or, or using artificial colorants or hormones or anything to artificially color the fish this is all you know is is tweaking the diet and tweaking the way that they live to to enhance the color naturally yeah well that's it you don't want to from a fish keeper's point of view why would you want to do all that to your your fish you know that's it's cheating almost isn't it you, you don't take, but personally, I wouldn't take the satisfaction of uh, somebody coming in and saying, oh, wow, look at the colour of that cichlid. And then you know that you've you've done something artificial to make it that colour. Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, to, to me, it, it, it doesn't interest me, the idea of, of hormone injections. And certainly the, you know, you get some fish that are actually painted and that yeah. just um, is horrible. It's the, the damage that it's doing to the fish. But that's not what we're talking about, just, you know, to make it clear. We're talking about how you you try and recreate the natural way that a fish would would be at its best. Yeah. And, and, and also understanding it. You know, I just find, as I said right at the start, I just find it fascinating the way that a fish can put on its best coloration. And, and knowing that, you're in control. You know, you can make sure that the colour is as good as it can be. And you can actually see the difference. That's the beauty of it. You know, this this white background, black background that I mentioned, just try it. It's it's amazing the difference it makes. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's something that I picked up quite, um, it was really apparent when I had uh, freshwater shrimps. We had, I've tried, I kept them in one aquarium with white gravel. And that was the first time I ever kept the shrimps. And they all went really pale and almost clear, but just with that tint. And then when I switched to a proper soil uh, and went, you know, the planet tank and all that kind of thing, the colours totally changed. Yes, yeah. That's, it's um, some the, the the 
Tetras that were in the tank as well demonstrated exactly the same behaviour. You know, as soon as you change that environment, they react to it. Yes, they do. And it, and it's interesting because there's there's a whole host of things that can impact the colour. You know, we've talked about bright light being bad for the, the coloration. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of our skin, if, if we go out in the sun, the melanin in our skin sort of spreads out a little bit and we and we go sort of a browner color yeah. if you I, I, you know at, at one of the um fish keeping meetings that i went to a guy was telling me <coughs> excuse me he he'd got some black moors so a, a black colored goldfish and he spent a lot of money bringing them over from china to, um to have in his his aquaria and when he received them they were just a gray color and they they were a gray color for a, a good week or so after he got them he contacted the breeder in in China who said just put them in a vat and put them out in the sun and he did that and they they turned to that lovely velvety black that that black moors black moors have so you know sometimes we're saying don't make the light too bright but actually sunlight can have a positive impact on on mm -hmm. the black some fish absolutely and I understand, you know that's the case with guppies and a few other fish well, sun, you know, it, it makes sense for the sun to have an effect on the fish because, yeah. they, you know, they don't have fluorescent lights or LED lights when they're in the wild. They've got the sun. Yeah. So to get, you know, that optimum colour, it makes sense to have them in the sun. It, it does. And yet with certain fish, if you put them in bright sunlight, they actually start to lose their colour because, and, and I, I don't know why, That I suppose that's the fascinating mm -hmm. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's that trial and error and trying to understand why. But yeah, certainly there's there's some of the black moors and some of the, the darker guppies really respond to, to sunlight and, and become more intensely intensely mm -hmm. coloured. I'm just seeing a, a, a comment there from Richie. Um, he's saying that tannin will alter a fish's colour. Is that something you've experienced as well? Um, the, the, some fish yeah definitely uh, fish that are used to um in inverted commas amazonian conditions so sort of peaty water low acidity low um low p sorry low ph and, and low hardness then definitely tannins will make a big difference um to my knowledge and, and I, I, i'm happy to be proved wrong but i think you're unlikely to to get a big impact of tannins in harder, more alkaline water. So, you know, tannins in a Malawi tank, first of all, it's it's kind of going against what you would be trying to achieve in a Malawi yeah, tank. Yeah. But I don't think it would have much impact in that sort of an environment, but definitely in the softer water, more acidic water tanks. Mm -hmm. And, with you know, with, with things like um, the tetras, certainly with the discus, um, and, and some of the other Amazonian and, and softwater fish, you can make a, a big difference with the blackwater tannin type additives. So is there anything that we can add to the aquarium other than food that would improve a fish's colour? Um, I, I, I guess there is. Well, yes, definitely there is. You, you can add things to the water to recreate the water that the fish would have naturally. So that's where the tannins and the blackwater extracts work for the Amazonian fish. Okay. We're adding some of the the salts, for example, for for the Malawis and the other Rift Valley cichlids. Mm -hmm. Helps. Um, they're also I don't know if they're still available. They used to be kind of algae additives, because in, interestingly, if you have fish in a garden pond that goes green due to the algae. Yeah. The coloration of the fish is stunning. When you actually get the fish out, you might not be able to see them, but when you take yeah. them out, the coloration is absolutely fantastic. And that's true of goldfish koi, but also if you put tropical species in during the summer. And there used to be these algae extracts. So I know uh, some time ago Tetra did a couple. They did a, a koi vital and a mm -hmm. cichlid vital, which were just algae extracts. And you could right. add those to the water, and they had the same impact as as the algae. They just made the the colour pigment spread, and the fish looked fantastic. That's great. So yeah, you can get some additives. Right. Okay, that's something to look out for then, because I, yeah. I, I I didn't know they existed. It was just something I wanted to ask. Um, I, I don't know if they still do, um, but they yeah. did. I, I I can't say I've looked for them. I 
I perhaps ought to, and then, <laughs> then mm. I could give you a more advised answer. I love yeah. it. Um, another thing the, um, from a, a more technical element of things that we can do to affect the fish's colour, um, most modern lights now offer you the, the option to increase certain spectrums of the light. Um, you know, you can put green up or the red up or the blue up or, you know, you can play around with it. Um, and they definitely have an effect on, on fish in saltwater aquariums. Um, I know they, you know, like the corals, they react completely different with the blue lights and they, they glow. Um, fish, not as much, but um, is there any anything that you can say in the freshwater aquarium? You know, certain types of lights or certain... Would you say a, a higher red would be better for bringing the colour out, or, or I, less red, maybe? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, you, you definitely can, by using different coloured lights, you can enhance certain colours. You, you're not actually enhancing, for example, the amount of blue or the amount of red that there is in a fish, but by using a red light with fish that have got red in, it reflects off the red and you and the red looks stronger mm -hmm. so you can make the fish look more red more blue more yellow by changing the spectrum of the light where i say i don't know i don't know if that has any impact on the distribution of the pigment in the fish or it's simply making the color stand out because i know with some of the red lights if you put a red ornament in there again the the, the red of the ornament shines and mm -hmm. that's that's just because the red is reflecting off it. Um, I'm sure with some of the modern lights where you can get softer tones and you can get different wavelengths, it will definitely help the fish. Because if you look at, you know, a really bright white light, that does make the pigment spray uh, contract. So you see a mm. pale fish. And if you have no light, then you, you tend to get the pigment spreading. So in between the two, there'll be an optimum where you can actually get good light and, and that will be the optimum for spreading the pigment and making the fish look as, as good as it could be. And I think that's one of the good things about the modern lights now is you've got that ability to tweak and, and set what works for you, you know, because every aquarium is different. Um, so I guess having that, you know that control and if fish coloring something that's really important it'd be worth investing in one of those type of lights it does gives you you know access to fine tune what you know what colors are coming through in the light and, and i think for for other areas you know if you can mimic dawn and dusk that tends to be when the fish <coughs> excuse me are the most active um are more likely to breed and by being more likely to breed they're going to be you know, in, in showing off better colours because they're yeah. trying to attract a mate. So definitely having the, those different pigment, the, the different wavelengths, you can influence the coloration of the fish. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know exactly, you know, I couldn't say do this and you'll get this colour, but it's something that would be fascinating to to play with, you know, to, to, to adjust, to try and find out what works best in a certain, certain fish tank. Yeah, and I guess that's part of fish keeping. It's just, you know, trial and error. Um, taking note of what does work and, and dismissing what doesn't work to get, you know, what's best for you and your fish. I, th I think, I mean, and certainly there is no one answer. That That is that is the beauty of fish keeping. You know, I can, mm. I, can, I can tell you one thing that I've found works and you could tell probably completely the opposite that's worked for you in, in, in the tanks and the, and the water quality and the fish that you're using and somebody else could give us a third answer. And, and we're yeah. all right. It's just for our particular tank environment. And, and that, that is what's fascinating because, you know, you can work it out, you can try different things and, and you end up with what's perfect for for fish in Aberdeen or fish in Southampton. You know, it's uh, it's just getting it right. That's it. Um, and I guess it's good being able to speak with other fish keepers and, and you know, hearing what works for them and trying it out and, if it doesn't work, then obviously it doesn't work. But again, trial and error, that's the best way to do it. It is. And that's and that's where, the, you know, it's its great to go to your local aquatic store. Um, yeah. You know, there's a place for online sales of fish. But if you go to your local aquatic store 
they can tell you what works for your water conditions yeah. in your area and they've acclimated the fish to those areas as well so the fish are used to it and also you know going along to your own aquatic society because again there's people from your locality that are that have been involved in the hobby for different lengths of time trying with different fish with different D different methods different water qualities different mixes of fish and they can all give you advice for that's that's appropriate to where you are and the type of fish that you you're probably trying to keep yeah i know so um that's me went through most of the questions um or all of the questions that i i wanted to ask um and i think what we'll do now is we can open up questions to everybody that's watching um, just also wait on some more questions coming through. A comment that uh, Stephen put up maybe about 20 minutes ago. I'm just going to put that up on the screen and let you read that. Um, it's more of a compliment towards the science, but I'll pop that up just. And if anyone else has questions um, that they want to ask Dave just now, just put them in the comments there um, and we'll get through them as quick as we can, okay? But here's um, Stephen's comment just now. There you go. Uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, curry tubs. Yeah, it's. it's I mean, it, what we've tried to do with the fish science foods is to use natural ingredients to to deliver the colour, to support the health system, um, <coughs> to generally make the fish as healthy as possible. Um, with, with with some of the other foods, you can use artificial ingredients. So you know, in terms of colour, we've tried to include things like purple carrot, shrimp, krill, chlorella, kelp, um, spinach. I'm trying to think what, what else we've used, but, you know, we're using natural ingredients that boost the coloration. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, th things like erythrin, which is the, the red colour pigment. You can use shrimp, and, and in my, my belief is that that's the best way of doing it, using a natural ingredient, because it covers all those slight different colours of red that you find in fish. But you can also go to a chemist and buy a, a white powder called erythrin and you just add that powder to the food and as long as it's absorbed by the fish then that will really boost the color but that's kind of an artificial way of doing it. it's not wrong but by, by any means it's it's just recreating what they do in the wild but it's mm -hmm. one red it's you know it's a scarlet red so and and fish aren't all scarlet you know you look at the number of reds there are in in an aquarium shop there are hundreds of them on different fish and, and within the same species so it's just a different approach I just believe in that that kind of natural way of trying to recreate what the fish are eating in the in the wild and recreate what their nutritional needs are mm -hmm. it's been great fun you know there's this you can develop it and develop it and develop it and there's still probably a long way to go with some of the foods but the curry tabs is you know is one example where along with Ian Fuller, we developed a range of, of um, a few different tablets and ended up with one that, that really seems to trigger a great response from, from the Corries, both in terms of wanting it, but once mm -hmm. they've started eating it, in terms of how they grow, how they develop and their, and their coloration. Yeah. Um, the Corrie tab is probably, um, in my opinion, one of the best fish foods that you've brought out. Um, I've still to meet somebody or, or, or chat to somebody online that doesn't get a response from that food. Yeah. It's fantastic. And <laughs> I, I, I see um, Stephen's last comment is just a, a good food for adult rainbow fish. Yeah. <clears throat> I would suggest, I mean, out of the fish science range, um, we've got probably the basic tropical flake would be a, a, a good food to include. I would definitely include some of the krill flake because that will just trigger and, and boost the red coloration in there. Depending on the, the species, it might also be worth looking at some of the granular foods. So either the um, the, the, the tropical granules or the tropical microgranules. Mm -hmm. um, those two, again, the granules sink and uh, sink in the water. The microgranules tend to sit in the surface tension and then slowly sink. So, but, you know, both of those would be, depending on the species, would be worth it. Yeah. And I, I mean, you, you know, I think a lot of people that know me know I, I'm, I'm a big fan of using a range of different foods. So 
you know, use a basic food. Maybe you use the tropical flake along with the krill flake as, as your base. But then you can add treats to to supplement that diet and make it a bit more interesting for you and for the fish. So with rainbow fish, you know, things like Daphnia, freeze-dried blood, uh, frozen bloodworm. Um, you might find some of the other frozen foods work well. You could try some of the vegetable matter. Just not all the time, and you wouldn't only feed it, but just to use it occasionally to to sort of supplement that base diet mm. really works well. And and it's just interesting to do. You know, if all you're doing is putting flake in every day, it's great and the fish respond really well. But there's quite a buzz somehow to putting some frozen bloodworm in there and seeing that that different reaction to the fish. Yeah, so, I agree. That is good. Um, and you can tell some fish do go crazy for certain foods and not so much for others but it's it's i like trying out new things um you know and wondering whether or not they're going to like it it's, it's good it's good fun yes it is that that's that's part of the enjoyment of the hobby i think yeah and you've got to keep it enjoyable you know otherwise it becomes a chore yes true. and that's when you just end up falling at the a trap of just feeding the same food every day not even watching them eat sometimes it's it's good. It's important for not just for the fish, but for the fish keeper to to continue to try different fish foods, and then everybody's happy. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, uh, we've got another question here from uh, Richie. It's a popular question from Richie. Yeah. Oh, not that one. He just moved up there. I will pop that one up. There we go. <laughs> Richie keeps asking me about the discus food. Where? A little bit closer. Um, we're, we're certainly working on on a discus food, trying to get one that would would work. Um, what I'm trying to do though is not just to have a, a another discus food. I'd like to have a, a food that really is as good as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm guessing at the moment we're probably still a good six months away from it, and I'm afraid I know when I've spoken to Richie before, I've probably said six months away. <laughs> and we're about the same um keep trying different things we're looking at soft foods or semi-soft foods to see if that'll work um trying different formulae just to try and get that that response and and, and trying to get a food that they like um, discus are interesting fish to feed in that they become fixated on a certain food or a certain type of food so you know a lot of people feed beef heart and the various beef heart recipes and getting them to come away from that onto dried or semi semi dry semi soft foods is a bit of a challenge but i think if we get the right formulae and and get you know the the attractants to discus we can do that we can certainly deliver a, a discus food so we're still yeah. working on it definitely mm -hmm. um and i know we had a quick chat just before we we went online tonight um dave but you mentioned that um the other foods that have been just kind of bubbling away are are very very close to appearing in the shops very close yeah they are the, the two foods that we've got that'll be coming out very very shortly but um, i mean i'm hoping by the end of the month obviously the the situation with the the covid restrictions has had an impact in that not not in terms of how we're working or anything but just in terms of getting hold of certain ingredients mm -hmm. but the, we have a cyclid stick and we have a sh uh, sorry a cichlid pellet and a shrimp stick that are are due out. Um, they're being produced next week, and then we've just got to package them, and then we get the transport to get them across here. So I would certainly hope, um, you know, all being well, that we should have them and, and be available to to ship out to the stores in by by the end of August. Oh, that's really good. But, but don't hold me to it because yeah. <laughs> now that are out of control are things like transport because, you know, whereas mm. we used to be able to ship things in, in a matter of, um, you know, a day or a day and a half. Now they're taking a lot longer just because of the restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, well, here, here's another question from Richie. Um, he said he's got a friend of his um, that swears by white worms, uh, but he wonders if that will affect, have any effect on the colour at all with them being white again i i honestly don't know um normally if you're feeding pigment to a fish in pigment in inverted commas <clears throat> so that might be 
you know something with red in it something with orange something with with yellow or whatever that's the color of the the thing that you're feeding and obviously white worm there is no pigment there so oh sorry there is no color there which i think mm. means there's no pigment in the white worm and therefore you're not going to have much impact on the coloration I, I don't know for certain but i don't think there's anything in white worm that would color the fish so i think it's more you know there's a lot of things that a food can do other than color the fish it can provide you know a balanced nutrient profile it can provide um protein it can provide all sorts of other things but I, with white worm my my thought would be it's not doing anything for the color yeah but i'm not 100 percent sure and, right maybe richard could try that out for us and get <laughs> yeah. <that> back <laughs> um right we've got another one from uh jane handley um that's a, a more specific question she's asking if you're thinking about adding some more vitamin e to aid reproduction but, yeah, I mean, and, and, and Jane and I spoke about vitamin E oh, before the uh, the restrictions came into place. So the start of the year, it's certainly something that we're we're looking at. And and it, what I'd like to do is just to do some trials with by adding a little bit more to some foods, and then if it works, then we could just you know generically add it to all the foods. Mm -hmm. It's going to be. I can't see that there's any downside. To having more vitamin E, um, and 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 the vitamins you can add to the food in in a couple of ways. You can add it by in, including more ingredients that have got vitamin E in them. But also with a lot of the foods, we add a vitamin supplement to the food so that you've got that backup of vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin D, and and some vitamin E. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy just to tweak that yeah uh, supplement to uh, to add to the foods. And that could, um, you know, gives you the potential to have a specific food for conditioning fish for breeding. You, you, could, you could do that. And interestingly, in the, the, you know, the distant past, there used to be a couple of conditioning foods on the on the market, and they were largely based on vegetable material. So I know Tetra used to have what was called a conditioning food, and that was essentially a, a vegetable flake. And that's because of you know the vitamin and the mineral profile in in the vegetables that were included. But yes, we could certainly look at that, or we could just make sure it's in all the the diets um, to make sure that there's slightly more, so that it'll it'll help the fish. But mm -hmm. I don't think there's any downsides to it I can, unless you go way over the top. Uh, you know, adding more and more vitamin E, for example, isn't going to adversely affect the fish, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Okay. Um... Well, I know I've just noticed Jane's put another comment on there, um, which kind of falls onto the question that Richie had, um, which was about the white worms. Um, I'm just wondering if Jane's, you know, if she's put that to trial herself, or if it's something that you know she was already aware of. So, um, I'm, I'm sure Jane. I mean, Jane d does um, does a lot of work with guppies and breeding guppies, so I'm sure she'll right, try okay. it. Um, and, and, and she's absolutely right. You know, if, if you can make sure the fish is in good condition and mm -hmm. it allows the colours to to show off at, at their best. You know, yeah. like we said before, if you've got unhealthy fish, it doesn't matter what pigment you've pushed into the fish, they're not going to display it properly. So if they're healthy and happy and, and stress free, then you've got that that template that the colours will show off at, at their absolute peak. Okay. Um, she's just aware she says she's not tried it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, has anyone else got any other questions for Dave? Um, we normally set a, a 30 minutes limit to these chats, but I don't just gone over a bit. <laughs> ever. Um, I mean, we're over an hour already, but um, anyone else got any questions at all? I think. Um, Somebody that was watching um, on, I think, the Lothian Fish Keepers face page, Facebook page, sorry, um, Shane McHenry's put up a, a crying emoji. So um, I was also wondering why he's crying. Um, <laughs> who knows? But um, yeah, I don't know if, if nobody's got any more questions. Um, I think we can maybe just call an end to this one. Um, yeah.
And, yeah. and we, 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 you know, our plan is to do something similar for for the next few Thursdays anyway. So if if yeah. anybody's got any questions, they can always ask them next week. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it'd be interesting as well. Um, if anyone wants to suggest a topic for us to discuss next Thursday, um, just either get in touch with um, myself or Dave directly on Facebook, um, and we'll we'll obviously line that up because um, it's it's about sharing information and. And finding out what what you all think, and um, just really bringing us all together for a little while, and enjoying the hobby, and taking advantage of Dave's massive <laughs> longest amount of knowledge on the hobby. <laughs> okay, um, so yep, yeah, thanks again, everybody. Um, I think we'll just say goodbye to Dave just now, um, and then I can ask a couple. Of, and I can I can chat, you know, for a few moments after that, and and then we'll close everything down officially. Okay, Dave. That's so fantastic. Thank Thanks ever so much and look forward yeah. to speaking to you next week. Okay. Take okay. care. Cheers. Uh, bye. bye. So, guys, um, thanks again for joining us um, for our live chat with Dave at Fish Science. Um, it's something that we want to do as often as possible. And we've, you know, Dave's agreed to do it for the next, you know, foreseeable future on every Thursday at 8 o'clock. And I think we really have a great opportunity to to learn more about the hobby. Um, and whilst Dave's happy to come on and chat to myself and answer our questions, the more questions that we can get for him, um, the more we can learn um, and the more we'll get out of it as well. So, um, yeah, um, like I said earlier on, any questions or any ideas for a, a subject, just send, a, you know, send it to me. Um, I'm happy to, to go over the flow. Um, it's all about you guys anyway. So um, thanks very much for joining us and um, we'll call it a night tonight. Okay. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.